Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, and Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Good morning, church. Can we stand together? Let's proclaim the gospel. Sing this with me. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole
God praise this morning. He's our King and our Savior. I love that song because it just documents what Jesus has done for us. It takes us through the whole story and what makes the story of Jesus so um, not just impactful but like life-changing and powerful and incredible is that He wasn't just our Savior but He's also our King. The King enthroned that humbled Himself to walk amongst us. And so this morning we're singing a lot of songs about how Jesus is the king of our lives. Because sometimes I think we look at him as savior and it's like, oh yes, we look at the gift of what Jesus has done and what he's given us. But when we acknowledge Jesus as king, it means we're giving everything that we have to him. We're seeing the love that he's displayed and saying, how could I hold my life back? Everything is yours. And so before we sing this next song, I want to read us a passage from Revelation. All throughout scripture, it talks about worship and singing. And this is one of those, those places where we see Jesus exalted as king. We're given this glimpse into the throne room of God. And so just to fill our hearts with, with awe and wonder for who Jesus is, I want to read it over us. It'll be on the back wall. I encourage you to read it along with me. It says, then I looked... And I heard the voices of myriads of angels in circles around the throne, as well as the voices of the living creatures and elders, myriads and myriads. I, I wanna pay attention to this myriads and myriads. Some scholars say that if that was translated literally, it could be upwards of 110 million angels. Just imagine that for a moment, a roaring sea of angels just erupting in praise as far as the eye could see. 
Verse 12 goes on to say, and as I watched, all of them were singing with thunderous voices, worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive great power and might, wealth and wisdom and honor, glory and praise. And then this is where we join in, saints. This is the part we play. It says, then every living being join the angelic choir every creature in heaven and on earth under the earth and in the sea and everything in them were worshiping with one voice saying praise honor glory and dominion be to god enthroned and to christ the lamb forever and ever this is what we get to participate in every weekend when we gather as his church we get to praise this king to give him the honor and glory that is due to his name. And so as we get ready to go into this next song that's full of all this type of language, I wanna give you a moment just to close your eyes where you're at. As I've kind of read this picture of God's throne room, to just think about that for a moment. Think about what it would look like to see over a hundred million angels worshiping what it means for all of creation to join in. God, I do ask that we would give you the honor and glory and praise that you deserve. That our hearts would be hungry for heaven. That our greatest joy would be to see you enthroned in all your glory and all your majesty. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land. song of ages to Cause your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name, it stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name, it stands above them all, and the angels cry. Holy, all creation cries. Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy If you've been redeemed, then sing the song forever to the Lamb. If you walk in freedom, and if you bear His name, then sing the song forever to the Lamb. Oh, yes, we'll sing the song forever. Your name is the greatest, your name, 
of our song this morning but more importantly you're you're worthy of every thought we think every step we take every relationship that we're in just every aspect of our lives so Holy Spirit I ask that you would teach us today teach us and transform us and and lead us in paths everlasting we need you and so would we not um, come into this room and convince ourselves otherwise that we can do this on our own, but would we grow in our desperation for you, in our hunger for you? Um, yeah, Jesus, we, we just thank you for who you are and what it is you're doing here in this church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Church, it's a good Sunday to be to be here. My name's Emily. I'm one of the worship pastors here at this campus. And on behalf of the whole team, we're really grateful um, that every week you choose to come and to worship with us, to give Jesus your song and your heart, more importantly. Um, why don't you take a moment, because we're a family here, turn to some people around you, say hello, meet someone new maybe, and then grab a seat. Well, good morning, Friends Church. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning as we seek Jesus together. Well, my name's Elizabeth Miller, and I'm one of the next-gen pastors here at Friends. And if you're new here or you feel new, we'd like to connect with you at our First Steps area located just outside the pavilion. That's where we'll give you a free gift just to say thank you for stopping by. And we'll also answer any questions you might have about getting connected here at Friends. I have a couple events I want to tell you about that are coming up. First is our Parent Connect. We have one happening this Wednesday, November 1st, and one also happening on Wednesday, November 15th. Now these events are specifically targeted for you parents to help resource you. So our first topic we'll be covering on the first is 
how to build resilience, confidence, and connections in your kids so they thrive. And so we hope to see you there. And then on the 15th, we're going to talk about how to build family traditions. With the holidays coming up, we want to help resource you to build your own family traditions. Those run from 7 to 8.30 in room 317. You can register for those online. Now, guys, in just a few hours, our parking lot is going to be completely transformed. Family Fun Fest is almost here. Yes, huge shout out. It's coming back. It's tomorrow from 4 to 8.30. And now, guys, I just have to do a huge shout out to our friends' family. Because of your generosity, we have made every volunteer and candy goal. So give yourselves a hand. Thank you. We are super excited. We're going to have about 536 of you partnering with us to serve tomorrow. And so we hope that if you're not serving, that you will think of someone you can invite, someone who hasn't been on our campus yet to experience the friends family. This is a free event. There's going to be food trucks. There's going to be face painting. There's going to be um, many, many rides. Now, the rides aren't free. Those are $20, they're a wristband, and you can purchase those. And to make it more convenient for you, we have two locations today, so you can avoid the lines tomorrow. We're gonna have it in the pavilion and also on the second floor landing. So go ahead and, and it also, if you've already gotten your wristbands and you need to pick them up, you can pick them up at those locations as well. Now, in addition, we are in the process of planting another campus in Tustin. And so if you're interested, if you have a heart for the people in Tustin, and if you would like to learn more about that campus, you can meet with Kyle Bleeker at the conclusion of this service in the backstage room. So now I'd like to invite the ushers forward, and I would ask that you would pray with me. Father, we just thank you for this morning. You are holy. We come before you and we ask that you would just your spirit would flow through Pastor Aaron this morning, that we would have hearts ready to receive your message. Thank you for this offering. Use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, uh, church. Good to see you today. My name is Aaron Opog. And if we haven't met before, it's because I have the joy of serving as a campus pastor at our Friends Church Eastvale campus. And it is great to be here. I get the chance to come every uh, maybe six months and share. And I want to thank you so much for your prayers for my family and our church. Uh, a little update about my family and I. We are doing wonderful. We have a new addition to our family. And I want to show a picture of her to you all. Here's a picture of our newest. There we go. Uh, her name is Misty. She's an Aussie doodle, and I think she had just jumped in the Yorba Linda Creek after that picture. Uh, and she has been a blessing to us in this season, and everyone at our church loves her as well. Um, our campus, our church is doing great. We uh, just had five people come to Christ last Sunday. 18 people have gotten baptized in the last month. Yeah, praise God for that. And uh, we went to two services in September, so we now have 9 and 11 o'clock service. And my church this morning uh, is praying for you all, and I want to thank you for your prayers from my congregation. I know we're in a different county, but we are all one tribe, one family. And so thank you for uh, supporting us and being part of the journey of that church. I have a question for you as we get into our study on James, and that is this. Have you ever thought that you had something, but then in the end you really didn't? You thought you had something, but in the end you really didn't. You thought you had good health. Then you went to the doctor. They said your cholesterol was a little low. You thought you had something and then you really didn't. You thought you had good car insurance and you got into a car accident and realized you checked off the cheaper box. You thought that you knew teenagers. Come, come on. <laughs> then, you know, you went, you went to a, a youth camp. You served as a counselor. You said, I know teenagers. Then you had your own. And your son got a mullet. 
Or your daughter's dating a guy with a mullet. What's going on with that trend these days? Who knows? You know, I, I thought that I, I, I got a new PR while I was running in college in cross country. And I crossed the finish line. I was like, oh, my word, my, my legs were moving fast. And then this guy with khaki pants and a, a, a blue polo shirt and a lanyard came up to me. And if you know that guy comes up to you at any event, you're in trouble, right? And he said, son, I'm so sorry I have to disqualify you. You, you didn't run the fourth mile. And I thought I had a PR, but in the end I was a cheater, okay. That's, uh, you know, you thought you had enough saved up for uh, retirement. And then your financial advisor said to you, you got to live a little tighter. Uh, you, you, you thought that your job was more secure. And then a recession came. You, you thought that a friend was, it was going to be a friend for life. And you knew them through and through. And then you started to talk about politics. And the friendship ended. Have you ever thought you had something, but in the end you really did not? You know, those scenarios are very real for us, uh, but not as important as the one that James brings up in our passage today. Because the most important question we could ask ourselves is, do we really have saving faith? Do we really have saving faith? Do we think we have it, but we really don't? How do you know if somebody is saved or not? How, how do you know if someone is, as we say as Christians, born again, they really have new birth? You know, our mission here as a church is that we would uh, become an authentic uh, community of Christ followers compelled to change our world. We want to make disciples of Jesus, little followers of Jesus who do what Jesus did with a lot of joy and a lot of love and obedience. How do you know if somebody really is a disciple, they really have it or not? Now that's the question that James poses and answers for us in our passage today. And so turn to James chapter 2 verse 14 and I'll begin reading the passage and then I'll pray and we'll break it down together this morning. James 2 14 says this, what good is it my brothers and sisters if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Father, this morning we thank you for the incredible worship we've already had a chance to enjoy together and it's been clear to me already that your spirit is tugging on hearts in this room and drawing us back together in connection with you. Maybe it's been a busy week, maybe we've come and we're tired and we're fatigued and Lord I pray that we would walk out of here this morning more encouraged and connected to Jesus uh, than when we walked in. We ask Lord Jesus that you would help us to listen to you, help us to hear from you and uh, most importantly Lord we want you to be glorified and so awaken our souls to what James has to say to us this morning and this passage. And maybe walk out of here just more connected, more encouraged, and more obedient to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So James writes to his congregation as a pastor. And he writes to them wanting to encourage them to love and show mercy to one another. Because their love and their mercy to one another was a little low. If you were here last week, I think Chris taught about mercy. And now James continues to pick up that theme. And he's concerned that his own congregation isn't loving one another the way that he hopes. I don't know if you ever watched the show Columbo from the 1980s. Not many people. I guess I was a nerd when I was in the 80s, I guess. A few people, thank you. Uh, Columbo, if you didn't ever watch it before, is like this detective and he always plays the fool and he asks a lot of questions and he, he always talks to the, the person who ends up being guilty, like kind of like he doesn't know anything. So he walks around and he's like, hey, you know, I just, I just don't get it. You know, he kind of shuffles around, I, I just don't understand. Well, that's kind of what James is doing in our passage. He's saying to his congregation, you know, I, I, just, I just don't understand. You know, you say that you are a follower of Jesus. But help, help me understand why your love and your mercy is so low and cold towards one another. I just don't get it. That's kind of what James is approaching this, this text and this passage about. He says in verse 14, if someone claims to have faith, you can see him scratching his head here, but has no deeds, can such faith save them? What quality of faith does somebody have, he says, if there's no evidence of that faith in their life? 
Is that the kind of quality of faith that is actually saving faith, he asks? He gives a case study in verse 15, a professed Christian. Someone who says, I claim to be a Christian, sees somebody in need. They don't have shoes, they don't have food, they don't have a shirt. And instead of being moved by their faith, by the work of the Spirit to help them, they just go, oh, I'm so sorry, brother. Oh, I'll be praying for you, sister. And then they never do. James is trying to show that our empty words in our Christian faith might actually point to empty faith. You know, we do that so often in our walk with Jesus. We, we hear about a need. Oh, I'll be praying for you. And then we don't. Or we hear about someone in our groups who might be in the hospital. And, oh, I wish you the best. But we don't bring them a meal or check up on them later on. It's so easy to talk the talk in the Christian faith. But what James is saying is that the evidence of you really having it is seen in our actions. Which is why he says in verse 17, look down with me, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is lukewarm? No. Much worse. It's dead. It's not passive faith. It's not dormant faith that there's no evidence. It's dead faith. And if you've ever been to a funeral with an open casket, you can tell if a person is dead or not. No matter how much makeup they put on that person, you know that there's no life in them. You can see it in their skin. There's a little smell and there's a sense of lifelessness in the room. The animated soul of a person is no longer in that body. And faith without works is like that, James says. The animated soul of faith isn't in a person if there is no evidence of faith in them. And so some may wonder, even in this congregation, Aaron, does that contradict the rest of the New Testament? I mean, I've been told my whole life it's just about Jesus, and it is. It's just about Jesus. But does this whole thing about evidence and works, uh, is that contradicting what the rest of the Bible teaches? In Romans 3.28 it says this, that we, are, uh, that we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. There it is. We're not saved by any works, Aaron. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, the famous passage, one of my favorites in the whole Bible. For it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this not of yourself, it's a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Aaron, pastor, says right there that we're not saved by works. Is there a contradiction? No, they're not. James is not contradicting the rest of the New Testament. It actually works in harmony. Jesus said this in Matthew 7. You will know them by their fruits. You'll know them. Who's the them? The them is you'll know if they're a real disciple or not. If they really have saving faith. By their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit and the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. You just love how straightforward Jesus is. Every tree that does not bear good fruits will be cut down and thrown into fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. The good fruit, which is our own good works, comes from a good tree. And that good tree is planted in saving faith in Jesus. So I got a plant right here. Is it real or is it fake? Seriously, what do you think? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's real? Anybody? Uh, Yeah, it looks pretty real. Who thinks it's fake? A lot of you. Okay. I mean, I couldn't tell. I picked it up and I said, man, is that real or fake? It's actually fake. But you don't know. You can touch it. It actually feels pretty real. The only way to know if it's real or fake is if you investigate its growth, right? You can only tell. But is, it really, is that real dirt in there? Will it actually grow? If I keep it in the dark, will it die? The only way to know is if you get up close and personal and see the evidence of it if it's actually real or not. And that's what Jesus and the rest of and James is saying here. The only way to know if you have saving faith is by whether or not this thing is actually alive or not. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 and return back to what Paul says. He says, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not as a result of works that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You see the progression We are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Nothing we do can earn his acceptance of us. Nothing that we can do can get his forgiveness. But when we receive Jesus in our life, the animated work of faith and the Holy Spirit comes into us. And there are works, there are evidence for us to show the world that we really have it or not. 
And this is confusing to us because we don't understand grace very well in the Western context. You see, everything that you do in your life, you earn. The grades you get in school, you earn those grades. The job you got, you earn that job. The bonus you got, you earn that, that bonus. We earn everything as Americans. But grace, you can't earn. Grace is free. You can't earn God's forgiveness. You can't earn God's love. You can't earn it. He freely gives it to you. You just got to receive it. But here's the tension as Americans. Anything that we think is free, we think is also really cheap as well. Like, oh, if it's free, it doesn't matter a whole lot. And so we get confused about grace. We start thinking grace must be like this participatory grace. A little bit of Jesus, a little bit of my works. A little bit of Jesus, a little bit of me. And maybe when I get to heaven, it gets all straightened out. Is that what James is saying? That grace is like a participatory grace? A little bit of him, a little bit of me, a little bit of Jesus? No. The grace that James is talking about in this passage, underlying it in the rest of the New Testament, is transformative grace. It changes a person's life. It's costly and not cheap, just like Diedrich Bonhoeffer talked about. It's costly because it costs Jesus Christ his life. And when that grace gets in you, when we start realizing that we can't earn it and it costs something, it starts changing a person from the inside out. You can't ever be the same. My favorite coffee shop in the city of Orange is called True Brew over in OPA. My wife and I love going there on dates and we get a vanilla latte and about five minutes after drinking it, I can feel the caffeine going through you, if you know what I'm talking about. And I, I feel like I could read a book on the couch and not fall asleep or stay up past 8 p.m. And, and not get tired. If you're past 40 like me, you know what I'm talking about. When you have Jesus in your life, it's like that. Jesus comes in your life, he awakens your soul. And you are animated to begin to live it out in real ways. You can talk the talk all you want, but the evidence that you really have saving faith is seen in the fruit and outpouring of your faith. Sadly, many Americans, though, who claim to be Christian don't realize that it's entirely possible to believe in God and not have saving faith. Let me repeat that, just so let that here, take that in. It is entirely possible to believe in God and not have saving faith. And that's what James tries to get into in verse 18. Look down there with me. You believe that there is one God. By the way, James is being sarcastic. So if you're sarcastic here, you get permission to be sarcastic for like five minutes in this passage right here, right? You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that there's one. And they shudder. You believe that there's a God? Oh, great. Good. Good for you, he says, right? Even the demons believe and they shudder. James is quoting the most important Jewish creed in Judaism called the Great Shema. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the Jews were commanded in Scripture to, to pray this and read this two times a day, in the morning and the evening. They're commanded to, to pray it uh, on, their, ha- on their, 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 their holidays and on the Sabbath day as well. And James is saying to people who were once Jewish, who had now believed in Jesus as their Messiah, hey, you pray the great Shema, but you don't know the God of the Shema. It's entirely possible to believe in God but not have saving faith. It's entirely possible to be in a church And to be in a ministry and to believe in God but not to have saving faith. That kind of belief in God never transforms a person. It never deepens a longing for more of God. See, real genuine faith deepens a longing for him. You want to know him more. James says that the kind of belief that doesn't have saving faith is like the demons. They believe in God on some level. In Mark chapter 1 verse 24, Jesus is casting out demons. And that probably seems a little foreign to us. Uh, But one of the demons gets casted out and speaks audibly and says, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. See, the demons even had a knowledge and a belief of God. But we would not count that as saving faith at all. It's entirely possible to believe in God and to not have saving faith. You might think, but pastor, I was born in the church, man. I was like born in the nursery. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? (laughs) My grandmother had a great faith and she passed it on to us. I can feel it. I know I have that faith. Hey, you know, God bless your family and growing up in a church and your grandma's faith, but your grandma's faith can't save you. Only Jesus Christ can. I I came down an aisle at a crusade. Good. Did it change you? 
Because the aisle can't save you, only Jesus Christ can. You see what James is trying to get at here. This is an uncomfortable passage. I grew up in a Christian home. Went to a Christian high school, Valley Christian Academy in Santa Maria, California. My mom and my grandma were the two best Bible teachers in all of Central Coast. Hundreds of women every week would go hear them teach. I heard my mom when I was eight years old going over her lectures and her study. I had a Bible in my room. I knew right and wrong. I had a conscience. If you'd asked me if I was a Christian, I would have said I was. But I, I had no fruit in my life. You could have tracked and plotted my moral decisions on an Excel sheet and it was getting worse as time was going on. Did I have saving faith? No, I did not have any saving faith until I was 19 years old. It's entirely possible to believe in God and not have saving faith. And you might wonder, well, how in the world is that possible? How could that exist in a great church like this? How could it exist in my congregation? How could it exist in a family? Well, it's because we have allowed faith to remain separate from genuine change in people's lives. We've allowed faith to remain separate from genuine change. That's what James gets to in verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. James is having an imaginary conversation uh, in this passage. And everyone just kind of shrug your shoulder from it. It kind of feels good, right? This is what's happening in this conversation. There's a guy who's kind of like, I, I picture him like, a rock, like he's like Rocky. He's like, hey, you got, you got faith, I got, I got deeds. Like he's, you know, he, hey, James, you got faith, I got deeds, man. He's trying to separate faith from deeds. And he's doing it in a very nonchalant kind of natural way. Hey, you got faith, I got deeds. What does it matter, man? He's trying to separate faith. And you, all get, you all get what I'm saying, right? He's trying to separate the two, this imaginary friend of James. But you can never separate faith and deeds, James says. They're always linked together. That's why he says back uh, in the next verse, show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. They're always linked. They're always tied. You cannot have one without the other. In 1859, a man named Charles Bloden walked from one side of the Niagara to the next on a tightrope without a safety harness. Maybe you've heard this story before. 170 feet across, 260 feet down. If he fell, he fell, falls to his death. He walks across it, no problem. Then he starts doing tricks on it. He walks it on stilts. I would love to see a TikTok of that, right? That would be pretty cool. He does it blindfolded, you know. I mean, I can't even imagine doing it blindfolded on a stage like this. Uh, he, then, he, then he went halfway across. He sat down on the rope and he cooks an omelet. This guy's crazy. This really happened. He looks at the crowd after doing all that. He says, who thinks I can put a man in a wheelbarrow and push him across the rope? And a guy goes, I, I think you could do that. I want to see that. I believe you can. And Charles Bloden looks at the man and says, will you get in the wheelbarrow and let me push you across? <laughs> and Charles Bloden's wife said, no. You know, or the man's wife. The man said, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, that story illustrates the difference between belief and saving faith. Saving faith always requires action. Saving faith always involves life change. Saving faith always gets into the wheelbarrow and says, I will trust in you. You can't have one without the other. And the early church knew this. A hundred years after Jesus resurrected from the dead, there were people saying that they professed to be Christians. And in order to protect the name of Jesus, they wouldn't allow uh, new believers to be baptized until they were three years in. They, 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 they surrounded them, they discipled them, they walked with them. But they wouldn't let them be baptized publicly until they were three years as a Christian. Because they were afraid that, and worried that they would have a bunch of people saying, I follow Jesus while walking around Rome and Thessaloniki and Ephesus and not actually living the life of Jesus. And it would ruin the name of Jesus everywhere. And that same challenge that they had then is the same one we have now. The most important question people in the 20th century were asking themselves about Christianity was, is it true? Is the Bible true? They were, people were asking that all the time. Is the resurrection true? Can you prove it to me? You all had an apologetics conference a few weeks ago. and Apologetics were really important. Those questions were, were coming a lot out of the 20th century. Is it true? And then Christian education was, was all about trying to train people like me to answer the questions, is it true? And those questions are still important, and if you have them, great. You, you need to keep asking them and, and finding answers for them, and there are great answers to them. But the next generation, Generation Y and Generation Z, they're not asking if it's true. They're asking, does it work? Does your faith work? Does, does, it, does it work? Show me. 
If you say you really believe in Jesus, show me that your faith impacts anxiety and depression and loneliness. Show me that it can change a family. Please, show me that it can show mercy to people. Please, the next generation is begging people to show it that it really works. And that's what James is trying to get in. And I'm not saying we should change our baptism you know, methods at all, but we can learn from the past generations, which is why James brings up two people from an earlier generation in his life. Uh, Abraham and Rahab. Abraham was a patriarch of the faith. Rahab was a prostitute. It says in verse 20 of our passage, um, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. Literally working together, mixing together. And the scriptures were fulfilled that said Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without uh, deeds is dead. Abraham and Rahab. Two very different people, but two very flawed people if you know their stories. Uh, Abraham was a liar and a deceiver and Rahab's sin was very public as a prostitute. Both flawed people, but both deeply believed in their core that nothing was too difficult for God. They believed in their core that God could do anything. In fact, it says in Hebrews that Abraham believed that God could raise people from the dead. It says in, in Joshua, uh, Rahab believed that God could, could do anything. It says, it says, we've heard that how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt. Both Rahab and, and Abraham believed that nothing was too difficult for God. You see, people with saving faith believe God can do anything. And so they honor God with everything. And their lives begin to show it. There's evidence to it. Church, your God can do anything. Whatever you're going through, there's nothing too difficult for our God. You know, my son uh, and my family and I went and saw uh, the solar eclipse two weeks ago. And I don't know if you saw it or not. We went to the local library over here. We got some, some sunglasses to look at it, you know, the special glasses. And I knew that I needed to explain to my kids about the glasses. So I said to my son, he's, he's nine, his name's Cole. I said, Cole, never look at the sun without these glasses, Okay. And I said, if, if you do, you know, you, like the sun will melt your eyeballs and it will come out of your head and they're never going to be able to, to, you know, fix your eyesight. And you should have seen my son's face. He was like, okay, dad, easy, easy, you know. If you look at the sun directly, your life is, is going to be changed. Your eyesight's going to be changed. And the same thing is true of God. When you get a glimpse of God, when you see God, your life cannot be... Cannot be the same. It's always going to be different. And Abraham and Rahab got a glimpse of God and they believed nothing was too hard for him. And their lives were changed. Louis Giglio has been a, a voice in my generation for about 20 years. And uh, about three weeks ago, he gave a sermon uh, about the same idea. And there was a little portion of it that was very edifying to me and I thought would be edifying to us this morning about the same idea that if we get a glimpse of God, then our lives can never be the same. So take a look at the screens at this clip. Understand and remember, I want to be moved constantly by the fact that God is mighty, but that he's also merciful. That he's high above, but that he was willing to step down. That he's glorious, but he's also gracious. I want to be moved constantly by the fact that he is perfect. But praise God, he's also patient. That he's to be feared. But he also forgives sin. That he is exclusive. But he's also inviting. He's enthroned. But he's also incarnate. He's Yahweh. But he's also Abba. My perfect father. He's mysterious, but he's also my God. He is the name above all names. But he also knows my name. He's grandeur, but he's also 
granular. He's king of kings, but he's also my friend. He's judge, but he's also savior. He's the champion, but he also champions the weak. He's sovereign over all, but he's attentive to me. He's all powerful, but he's tender. He's rock solid, but he's gentle. He's unchanging, but he's relevant. He's truth, but he's welcoming. He's self-sufficient, but he's seeking worshipers. He's the best, but he's willing to hang out with the worst. He knows the worst of me, but he gave his best for me. He's God and good all by himself, but he generously shares himself with you and me. He's steadfast in holiness, but he's slow to anger. He's justified to dispense wrath, but he's eager to save. He's holding the whole cosmos, but he's also holding my hand. He's the centerpiece of heaven, but he's in the midst of my circumstance on earth. He's the owner of all, but he's not stingy. He's God, but he became a man. He's other, but he understands. He's the living God, but he died my death. He's Lord of all, yet a friend of sinners. He's in need of nothing, yet he desires a relationship with me. He sends lightning and thunder from his throne, yet he covers me in his grace. He's most worthy to be praised, but he was willing to be mocked. He deserves all honor, yet he humbled himself. He's seated on a throne, but he made a place for me to sit there with him. He's gone ahead, but he hasn't left me behind. He's uncontainable, but he lives in me. He called the universe into existence, yet he calls me his own. Yeah, you can give it up for the Lord. That's good. There's nothing too difficult for our God. And people who have saving faith know he can do anything so they'll honor him and live for him in everything. Do you remember that children's song, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your life will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. What God is saying to us, church, is that if you're saved and you know it, then your life will surely show it. So does it? Does it show it? You'll see it and show up and people who serve at Family Fun Fest on Monday night, smiling, giving out candy. You'll, you'll, you'll see it in parents who kneel by the bed and pray the Lord's Prayer with their kids. You'll see it in 20-somethings who reject a influencer culture to want to be committed humbly to a group of people who follow Jesus. You'll see it in people who have anxiety and depression and cancer. And if you ask them what they're thankful for, they'll tell you all the things that God has done in their life. You'll, you'll see it come out. Now, I don't mean to cause anybody any insecurity about their salvation or their faith in Christ. I know some people may have a, a pretty, you know, uh, perfectionistic conscience. And you're looking at your, yourself and go, man, I just don't add up. And let me just reassure you that 1 John 5, 12 says, if you have the Son, you have life. And if you don't have the Son, you don't have life. If you believe in Jesus, you have life. Don't worry about that. But maybe James chapter 2 about faith and works will get into your heart a little bit today. And a little bit more of the son's life will be seen in how you live in your neighborhood, in your home, in your workplace. But maybe today you don't have the son. 
Maybe today uh, you've been a Christian by namesake only. You've been living off your grandma's faith or your parents' faith or you've been coming to church trying to figure out what this whole thing is. And, and you've come today and I want to just take a moment to introduce you to Jesus, if I may. I want you to have the son. I want you to have life. And it's so simple that even a child can understand it. It's just A, B, C. And if you've gone through the rooted course, you know what I'm talking about. It's just A, acknowledge that we've sinned. And I love that, that idea. I, I know it's not popular, but I am a sinner. All it means to be a sinner is to be human. <laughs> to miss God's mark and design for our lives and attitude and, and thought and action. And to say, Lord, I have sinned. I need you. I have a need. It's kind of what we were singing earlier. And, and then it's, it's B, it's to believe in Jesus. To believe that he's the son of God, that he's the king of kings. That he died on the cross for your sins and my sins to forgive us. That he's fully human and fully God. To believe in him. To trust in him and his love. That he lived the life that you could not. He died the death that we deserved. And then it's to commit to him. It's to have faith in him. But not just intellectual faith, but a, a real life commitment to him. To say, I'm going to live for you. I want to ask if you would empower me to live for you, Jesus. And I commit myself. A, B, C. And if this morning, if you've never done that before, or maybe in a new way, you just realize, man, I've just been kind of going through the motions of, of what it means to be a Christian. I don't know if I really am today. I want to just lead us in a prayer. And if you know Jesus in this room, you know how important this is for people. So pray for those who are maybe trying to figure out this whole thing as we pray. And so would you bow with me in a word of prayer as we wrap up today. God, thank you for this morning. And you can see there's no band on stage. This is not just this emotional moment. This is just simply faith in you and God. And if this today you realize that I don't have this kind of saving faith. I thought I had it, but I really don't. I want to lead us in a prayer. And so you could pray it after me in your own heart. But pray it in faith to Jesus. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I have sinned against you. I have missed the mark. And if there's any sin coming up in your life right now, maybe, maybe it's, it's an issue that's going on. Maybe it's something that you've done or someone you've hurt. Maybe just confess that sin before the Lord and say, forgive me. Forgive me of my sin. And then it's B, it's believing in Jesus. You can say, Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for me, that you love me, and I receive your love for me today. And I put my trust and my hope in you for my forgiveness. Please come into my life and lead my life. I surrender my life to you today. Say that to the Lord in faith. And then finally, it's the commitment. Lord Jesus, I commit my life to you today. Take my life. Take the purposes you have for me. Help me to live for you, to glorify you. You know, we had a few people last night come to know Christ. And I just want to ask you, I know this seems really hokey and religious at times, but it's important. And I want to ask if you this morning just prayed that, just to raise your hand between me and you and the Lord. Just want to see and just acknowledge that. Anybody? Yeah, a few people. Thank you. God bless you guys. Thank you. Several hands in the room. The Bible says that if you pray that you are a child of God, that you're his today. And we celebrate that. And I would love to meet you after service right over here in the front um, and just pray with you. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for James chapter 2. Thank you for this church. I love this church. I've been a part of this community for 14 years. And it just keeps getting better and better and more like you, Jesus. So thank you for what you're doing here. And we entrust this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me for one more song?
between was torn apart. Now you hold the keys to the grave. As you bring things to life, you roll stones away. All praise to the Lord Most High. All praise to the One who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ. send us out with a blessing. So if you put your hands out, just in a posture of receiving. Friends Church, I want to bless you to live out of the grace of God. Freely given to you today. Not earned. And so you, would you go in His love and His peace and His mercy that He gives to you today. God bless you. Love you. Good to be here today. Have a great week and, and a great Sunday. Take care.